right, so welcome to the Healing Chronicles. And good evening. Thank you for joining us. If you're here for the first time, uh, The Healing Chronicles is a monthly discussion series uh, curated by myself and co-hosted by Rhonda Mendoza. And we have uh, a, a few regulars. It's wonderful to see your faces and it's really good to see uh, some newbies on the line. So um, we've got a lot to talk about this evening. I just want to start off with a couple of the rules of engagement. Um, we expect a very profound discussion this evening and um, there may be some tension but it is necessary that we talk about uh, the elephants in the room so that we can reconcile what we can learn and we can learn from one another and we can reconcile and we can heal as a nation and as a world so if you don't garner the same opinion as someone you know we, we're adults we don't attack we just agree to disagree um, allow other people to finish their thoughts. Uh, this is going to be, tonight is primarily going to be a uh, freestyle discussion. And, um, you know, we want to be honest because if <laughs> I, I read an article where uh, when it came, 74 million people voted for uh, Donald Trump. And they the article was saying that a lot of people feel intimidated about uh, stating whether or not, you know, if they talk about Obama, they're racist, or if they talk about Kamala Harris, then they're racist and, you know, have misogynistic and have problems with black women. So they stay quiet. But when they go to the polls, they are voting for uh, not necessarily Donald Trump himself, but that which uh, he espoused. So um, let's, let's be honest and let's, let's talk about it. Our co-host, Rhonda Mendoza. Rhonda, you want to say hi to the people? Hello, everyone. Good evening. Hi, Rhonda. Hi. So great to see everyone. And Rhonda will be, uh, she'll be moderating the Q&A down at the bottom. If you want to jump in and ask a question, fine. If you want to type in your question, we are open to that as well. So thank you, Rhonda, for being here and always having my back. I appreciate you. Okay, so this, the, today's discussion uh, is dedicated to my Jewish brothers and sisters on this International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, you know, we saw some really, really horrible uh, images on January 6th, um, one that I never thought I would have seen in a lifetime, and I didn't think that I would see it because I ne the thought never occurred to me that something like this could happen a stone's throw away from where most of us live. And this, you know, guy's wearing a Camp Auschwitz shirt, which I just, you know, th there is just, um, that's just hard to forgive. <laughs> um, so he is being dealt with, but um, this is, you know, th this is just in remembrance of, so. I won't labor too long on him, okay? And we have had, you know, I, I saw a meme <laughs> I saw a meme a couple of weeks ago that said 2021 left the room 
went and put on a wig and came, I mean, 2020 left the room, came back as, put on a wig and came back as 2021. We have had one heck of a 27 days, but I yeah. am hopeful. And every Wednesday this year, uh, there has been something that's happened that, you know, is, is historical in its own right. So as you know, we started off with the insurrection and, and today I heard that a six, well, another police, DC police officer committed suicide, bringing the death toll to six on that day. Um, the following week with a vote of 232 to 197, the house impeached Donald Trump, citizen Donald Trump. And on the 20th, we had a beautiful historic inauguration. And this Wednesday today, uh, Department of Homeland Security issued a domestic terror alert because it appears as if as a result of the shenanigans on December 6th that some groups feel emboldened so that we have to be on alert and, um, and, and cautious uh, moving forward. So there are still challenges uh, that we have with this pandemic, um, but help is on the way. COVID-19. Um, as many of you know, some of the millionaires became billionaires and, you know, the rich got richer or the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. So hopefully uh, this administration will do some things to address that. Uh, we had a beautiful moment by little poet laureate Amanda Gordon, extremely hopeful. And um, Tom Brady pulled it off again is bringing those <laughs> the, the Tampa Bay Bucks to the Super Bowl. So that's good news. Um, although I'll be rooting for Kansas City. And, uh, you know, our, our STEMI STEM stimulus checks are, are supposed to be coming. So see, we'll see what happens there. But I'm very hopeful in the first uh, 27 days, President Joe Biden has signed 30 executive orders. And those orders are, uh, have dealt primarily with the economy, the environment, immigration, um, ethics, the coronavirus, the, prim the, the bulk of them have dealt with the coronavirus and equity and, um, and um, <coughs> regulations. So I am looking forward to what this year will bring, but I think we're all stronger as a result of 2020. Yeah. So let's get into it, shall we? Uh, if, if, if you haven't heard, uh, there's a new, there's a, well, it's not necessarily new, but um, for women uh, that were, that are white women that are over 60, there is a name for uh, those women who feel entitled that they can call the police on black people or people of color and um, uh, evidence with Amy Cooper um, from the Central Park, you know, Central Park calling the cops on the Central Park bird watcher uh, this <clears throat> past year which was an extremely poignant example of a quote unquote Karen. So they you know, say that Karen is a pejorative term for women seeming to be entitled or demanding beyond the scope of what is normal. So I wanted to, to take a little bit to talk about, and this is just my opinion only, of why I think there have been um, tensions since um, time memorial with white women and uh, just other people of color, black women and white males. And I, I think that um, largely if, if, if we go back to um, times when um, Black people were enslaved and the, uh, the mistress of plantations were um, put on a pedestal, so to speak, and their husbands uh, at will would go and um, sexually assault the slaves. And they had to, you know, more or less deal with it. Then sometimes their husbands would have to go out of town and they would be responsible for running the plantation. And part of that running the plantation was also making sure that they kept the slaves in check. And there's also many, many white mistresses were given slaves as presents when they were young. So I'm glad that Dr. Sonia Clyburn has joined us, a clinical psychologist, because she may be able to speak to um, the pathology of white women during uh, slavery and the relationships with their female slaves, which, you know, and, and to the relationship that we had, even with, uh, we just had a hundred years of um, celebrating women's right to vote. 
but there was still tensions back in the day, a hundred years ago between um, black women and white women about the voting issue. So there, there's a, um, a lot to kind of unpack here. And again, I'm not going to dwell. I want to, um, Catherine, have you, Catherine Bainbridge, have you joined yet? <coughs> okay. um, so we're gonna look at uh, the concept of white fragility. We're gonna look at the concept of white rage, um, which, you know, goes back, not even just in this country, um, you know, there are some European roots there. But I'll let you read um, this description by the nation. And just take a look at some of the pictures that I pulled. Um, the hanging picture is very hard to look at, but as you can see, some of the men in this picture are smiling. It, it just struck me. And during the insurrection to see um, some of the people taking the ends of their flagpoles and, and, and chucking them like, like spears. Um, and you know, the, the, the video of the mob pressing the policeman against the glass, just with no regard whatsoever, um, to his, to his health. Um, they're similar. And then down in the corner, you know, you have a little baby in, um, in clan gear. So th this, this, this hatred thing is, is definitely taught. And then you have, you know, the gentleman, um, I don't, you know, the men on the right hand, in the right hand corner who stormed the Capitol and who had no problems with doing it. And so I think that's where, you know, rage and uh, privilege all blend in together. Um, and so Robin DiAngelo, many of you are familiar with the book, uh, White Fragility, she wrote, um, and she talks about, you know, white privilege, what she believes white privilege is. And uh, I'll read this and then I'll introduce our guests. White privilege is the automatic taken for granted advantage bestowed upon white people as a result of living in a society based on the premise of white as the human ideal. Oh, if you could mute your, um, if you could mute your uh, microphones, that'd be great. And that from its founding established white advantage as a matter of law and today as a matter of policy and practice. It doesn't matter if you agree with it, if you want it, if you even are aware of it. It is 24 7, 365. One of the reasons why it's so hard for white people to see it, well, there are many reasons, but one is it serves us not to see it. We come to feel entitled to it and that uh, that advantage, we're told that we deserve it and that we earned it. And we take the great umbrage when that is challenged. Some of the research that I did, I was writing a screenplay last year, um, showed that the planters, the white plantation owners felt as if owning slaves was a divine right. So you have that sentiment of, you know, this is my property. And, you know, even the, the wives and the women were considered property. But I, I believe that certain things are, are passed down. So we're going to talk about it. Um, one of our guest speakers tonight is uh, attorney Georgia Gosley. Uh, she has, boy, does she have stories to tell. Uh, she's a former federal prosecutor, television personality, and uh, as, as I mentioned, an attorney and a, a still practicing attorney. And then if she's able to join, uh, we have Catherine Bainbridge, who is the award-winning director of Rumble, the Indians Who Rocked the World. Catherine is out of Canada, but currently she's in Costa Rica and uh, told me she may not be able to join because their internet is spotty. Okay. So with that, I'm going to stop this share. And I had one thing uh, that I wanted to read from the notes about the uh, women on the plantation. Um, a southerner uh, called Mary Chestnut in 1861 talked about uh, the thing that we cannot name and she, with regard to the uh, sexual misconduct. She says, every lady tells you who is the father of all the mulatto children in everybody's household, but those in her own, she seems to think drop from the clouds or pretends so to think. So with that, 
I am going to open up the room. And Mrs. Gosley, uh, who else? Oh, okay, I can see who we have with us. Hey, guys, welcome, everyone. Mrs. Gosley. Hi, Manda. Hi. Do you want to jump in and talk about um, the <laughs> your experience? Yeah. And in the real life moments that you've had with regard to white privilege and how it manifests, you know, in the law. Well, yeah, I, I first of all, I just want to thank you, Manda, for bringing uh, this age old subject. I mean, we've been in America all of our lives and we were just having a conversation yesterday to say, what are white people mad about? What are they angry about when they can just take a shower, put on a fresh suit and walk in and get a job when I have a JV degree and I can't get it. They have all of this privilege and it breaks my heart to live in America at this time. I mean, I was, I, I was in college in the 60s and debating with uh, my sons the other day whether now is worse than the 60s. And I said, today is worse in my judgment from living the experience in the 60s because we didn't have the vivid reality of day to day being black men and women being shot down in the streets. Of course, that was going on in the 60s and the 70s. We were still in coming out of uh, Jim Crow and merging into segregation. But the, the stark reality of uh, um, a white police officer's knee on somebody's neck being recorded, the sheer audacity of those kinds of things. I mean, I, I wish. I could even begin to think of a solution. Um, my dear friend, Dr. Patricia Newton, who recently on as a noted psychiatrist, and she shared with me her thoughts. She said that much of the anger, the rage, the hostility that was experienced during slavery by white, white people, as well as black people, of course, we as the descendant of slaves, uh, are in, our, in my judgment, ha, are justified in, in wanting more and in, in demanding respect. But a lot of the white Americans, she uh, believed a lot of the memory cells that transferred into the modern day white Americans who still believe for some ungodly reason that the sheer color of their skin makes them superior. And uh, I grew up in a household where that was just never entertained. So. It, it still just bogs my mind. I mean, my experiences go back to, you know, practicing law in Baltimore for 20 years, I did criminal defense. And whenever I had a white male defendant to go to court for murder, robbery, rape, drugs, didn't matter. I literally, of course I did, I literally didn't even have to prepare because it's just a different society and a different world when you're white in America. Thank you, Ms. Gazi. Dr. Clyburn, do you want to uh, comment on that? Okay, I saw her enter. Okay, yes. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. I, I definitely will uh, agree with um, Ms. Gosley. I think partly um, some of the psychological aspects of anger results in fear, you know, and um, what it means to them, what it, what, um, fear is very strong. Um, it, it can show up in competitiveness, your self-worth, all those types of things. So I think part of the process with some of the privilege and identifying how it shows up, um, is really their fear, the fear of, um, demographic change, fear of what it will look like if, other people were in charge or, you know, their fear of losing their sense of safety. So there's so many different aspects of fear that could be examined. Could I just ask you, do you think they're afraid because they anticipate if the power were, were reversed and we as African-Americans or people of color, if we become in charge, you think they're afraid because they think we would do them like they do us? Yes. Yeah, that because that's mm -hmm. what I think. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, um, you know, it's a strange and weird feeling. I lived in Europe. I lived in Switzerland for a while where I taught international business law and I lived in London. London's a different thing. But to be around and live around white people who don't feel superior, 
who don't feel racist in their heart as much of um, uh, much of white America does. Not all, not all of white America, white America, but much too much of white America feels that way. It is a different feel. It is so strange and so different. You, as an African American who grew up in America, you really have to sit down and examine yourself and say, is it possible? For even for the Europeans, the Swiss white people, are they're not racist. They don't feel superior. They don't marginalize you. They don't berate you. They don't take on the conduct in, I won't say London, but I'll say in Switzerland, Zurich and Geneva, where I lived. And for me, as an African-American who grew up in this country, wow, what an eye opener. Okay, any of my white brothers and sisters, do you have anything to say about that? I wish I had some insight into that, but I, I am as mystified as you are. And I think it's just the, the way we've taught people, not how I was taught, but a lot of white people just continuing to um, intentionally or accidentally by their own ignorance or or uh, ill will, continuing that sort of education and then the institutionalization of, of things like real estate laws and, and all of those things that I have white friends who, in who I consider enlightened and educated until this George Floyd and this whole uh, social justice movement were kind of scratching their heads and unaware of you know, 400 years of history. And I was shocked. But it's, um, it's sort of rampant among white people to either look the other way or just be uneducated about it. You know, I, um, I think that this, this challenge, as well as uh, other challenges. There are mothers of some of these perpetrators. That exist are because, uh, you know, if you're white, living quote unquote in a white world, you don't have to understand um, the plight of anyone else other outside of what you consider to be normal. And, you know, if and it, just as we are with disabled people, a lot of times we don't think about, um, you know, until OSHA came into effect, building uh, buildings for people that were disabled because m many people who were a part of the power structure weren't disabled and just, just didn't think about it. I know I worked for a fintech company a couple of years ago, and my uh, my supervisor was like a typical Silicon Valley guy, you know, hoodies and corduroy. And he wore that everywhere, you know, major meetings. And uh, and his colleague was uh, kind of like a, a guy straight out of a GQ magazine. So they're in San Francisco. They come to DC for a meeting, and they want me to come to the meeting with them. So they said, you know, come to the hotel, Manda, and we'll have breakfast. Uh, in the morning. It was one of those hotels where you get free breakfast. And I said, uh, that's okay. They said, no, no, no. And this is in Northern Virginia. So to my Virginia people, I love you all, but I was a little reticent about getting the free breakfast. No, 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 Amanda, come on, come on. I said, okay. So I walk in the hotel, I meet him, I meet him at the, um, you know, in the little area, the dining area. And they say, yeah, go up and look, go up and look and see what we have. This is great. The breakfast is delicious. Well, okay, uh, so I'll walk and I see a sign, you know, before you get your plate, you, you, you know, you, you should show your room card. So I go back and I'm like, guys, I need one of your room cards. Well, why do you need that? We didn't need it. I'm like, trust me, I need your room card. Well, we don't have it because they were checking room card. Yep. We don't have it. We, we you know, we, we're about to leave. I said, okay, what room were you in? 805. Just give me a note. So I go back. And a little Latina lady's making omelets, and there is um, an African lady walking around, you know, making sure everything is clean, so on and so forth. So I decided that I was going to ask for an omelet, uh, and and then the African lady jumps up and says, "You you don't you don't uh you know you you're not here you're not a guest here," and I was like, "Excuse me, yes you you don't you have to pay for your breakfast." She went off, and I'm like, "I'm in room 805. Thank you very much." No, you cannot get a free breakfast. So I go back to the table and I don't know what they said, but I ended up with my free omelet and 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 so on and so forth. But the, the they could not believe 
that this had happened. And I'm like, okay, you guys, I'm not just making this up. And so, so then my boss said, well, whenever you want me to come and throw my white privilege around, I'm happy to do that for you. You know, and he kind of made light of it, but it just struck me that, you know, how easy things can be for white people and they don't even realize it. So when we talk about how tough things are, it's like, this isn't fallacy, this is real. What are your thoughts? Well, I have a thought about that, Monda, because it is an accumulation of those experiences over and over and over and over again. First of all, your heart starts to race and your adrenaline starts to pump because you know that something, because that's just the way we grew up in America. And then you get the stressor, then you react to the stressor and you pile that one on to one from yesterday. Then they wanna know why African-Americans die so damn earlier than white people because just living in America, the sheer stress level of everyday living, I remember so well and I never forget this. I was living, feeling so wonderful physically. I came in to Dulles Airport and I came through customs and as soon as I came back to America, I had been out of the country for two years living in Europe. As soon as I came through the, st the turnstile, I felt something jump on my back. And you know what that was. I had enjoyed a privilege that, that I had not experienced in my own home country. And so all of those experiences, it just makes life as best. Mrs. Gaza, you're freezing a little bit. Okay. But while she's um, speaking about that, I think one of the things um, that as she was speaking, it, there is a thing called black fatigue. Living in America as a, as a person of color and what that looks like. Um, Cause of all the microaggressions, all the things that we go through on a daily basis that some people are not even query to, privy to. Um, so there is a book called Black Fatigue by Mary Frances Winters, I believe. If that's something, if you're interested in learning and reading to get a better understanding, definitely it gives you a person who's not of color, a black person, perhaps you can understand some of the demands that we go through on a daily basis. Thank you, Dr. Sonia. So we have our, our resident octogenarian on, the lovely and wonderful uh, Sora Margaret Morrison. Sora Margaret, do you have anything that you wanna to contribute to the conversation? Well, hello everybody. I wasn't expecting you to call my name. <laughs> Listening and learning. But it struck me that what we're talking about is something that we've talked about for, well, forever, really. And I'm always reminded of an article of a letter written by James Baldwin. And it is as pertinent today as it was when he wrote it in 1963, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And you might have seen me get up to go to my bookshelf to get it, if I can just read a few words about that. Absolutely. He's, Take your time. He, he's writing a letter to his uh, young nephew and it's called, My Dungeon Shook and My Chains Fell Off. And a part of that he is stating, telling his, his young nephew, they are, meaning white people, in effect still trapped in a history which they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. They have had to believe for many years and, innum and for innumerable reasons that black men are inferior to white men. Many of them know better, but as you will discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act is to be committed. And to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflame. You'd be frightened because it is out of the order. 
It is out of the order of nature. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying because it so profoundly attacks one's sense and of one's own reality. And he goes on to say the black man is functioned in this reality that the white man has put there for them. He said, but you don't be afraid. I said that it was intended that you should perish in the ghetto, perish by never being allowed to go beyond the white man's definitions, by never being allowed to spell your proper name. You have, and many of us have, defeated this intention. And by a terrible law, a terrible paradox, those innocents who believe that your imprisonment, imprisonment made them safe are losing their grasp of reality. And it's a beautiful letter. It's very short and I encourage all of you to pick, get a copy. It's, it's in the book called The Fire Next Time, but it's the first part of that book. And what he is describing in 1963 is what we're talking about here in what, 2021. And it just, it goes on and on, and it never seems to have a, an ending that treats a black and brown body as if the body was a human being. And I don't know how you continue not to address it. And at the same time, I don't understand how we can't solve the problem of looking at a person and saying, yeah, that's a human being, a heart, a soul, a mind. And... But, but I, I would encourage the typical white person has never read a number of books dealing with black history, a W.B. Du Bois or James Baldwin, whereas the typical black person has had no choice but to know white history because that's what they teach us in schools, in college, high school, grammar, you name it, college, master's degree, PhD. So if, if, if some of the white people who are indifferent or, or who don't seem to think that it matters what they think or what, that they don't do anything, if they were to read what it is to be Black in America from a perspective of somebody who lived it, like a W.B. Du Bois writing in the early 1920s, I think you would understand. We wouldn't have had to have so many conversations about it. So, so uh, Monda, I know you didn't ask me to talk forever, so I'm going to stop at this point. I just encourage, I'm appreciating the comments and the statements that uh, have been shared thus far, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the evening. Thank you. You know you always have a stage here. Thank you. You all can, uh, <laughs> Ms. Margaret Morrison is a, um, I, I consider her a national treasure. I poached her off of um, C.J. Krim, the director of, of Resisterhood, and Ross Stansfield, who was on the, on the uh, discussion with us tonight, who was a cinematographer for the documentary, a uh, very moving documentary, which looked at um, voting from what, what, what campaign was it after? Tell us a little bit more about it, either Ross or Margaret, so that people can make sure that they watch the documentary. Ross, do you want to say anything? Sure. And uh, I'm very happy to be here with Manda and my good friend, Margaret, who I've gotten to know over three years and learned a lot. And she's always got great answers. So even though she said, oh, I'm not prepared, bam, out it comes. <laughs> so. Um, Resisterhood was created by Cheryl Krim, who has 12 Emmys. She is a very good filmmaker. Uh, I'm a member of TIVA, and there was a note, anybody want to help film the first Women's March? And I'm like, yeah, right on. Because <clears throat> I did not like Trump, what he stood for. Uh, I was very disappointed that he had become elected. I mean, it looked like we're going to go backwards again. Uh, so I covered the first Women's March with Cheryl and others. Uh, I got to see how it, there seemed like a million people there. I don't know how many it really was, but I went to Woodstock. You could see everybody there. It was 500,000, but they're all in a bowl. So you can see them. This one, you can't. They're straight ahead to the side behind you going up. A lot of people were saying, no, this is not what we want. It took four years 
but we did get through that. We now have a chance to maybe make things better again, bring the pendulum back. I'm certainly hoping that that happens. Uh, the things that happened on the 6th were shocking and not totally unexpected because of the lies that Trump had been touting for a while. He, he had a lot of game plan because he didn't want to go to jail. <laughs> so you got a president that his whole plan is, how do I stay out of prison? That's something wrong with that. Um, this is not who we are or who we should be. So I'm thinking he needs to be prosecuted. He needs to be convicted. He needs to be set as an example. And the people that broke into the Capitol also need to be prosecuted because they may have been misled, but it's still wrong. It's not like, oh, well, hey, I'm a white guy. I can get in here. It's no problem. No, you got to be, you know, you got to be talked to big time and spend some, you know, jail time. And maybe people will go, oh, was that wrong? Maybe. <laughs> you've still got Fox News. You've got the crazy QAnons. You've got a couple of people in uh, Congress that are doing bad, bad, bad things. So there's a lot we have to do. Um, obviously, there's what, 36 people here that are thinking, yes, there's some things we need to do. Um, I don't know. So that's, that's my little top off my head speech. I didn't get a chance to read any quotes. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Manda. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Ross. And we have, looks like the chat is blowing up. So um, Rhonda, I know that an Anna Strauss, Bayona Strauss has something she wants to say. And Robert Webb Bay has something that he wants to say. At least those are the ones that I know. So Rhonda, I'm gonna go ahead and let you curate. And um, just to finish up my introduction of uh, Mrs. Morrison, she's been an activist since Hector was a puppy when she was little. <laughs> and she was involved in the march uh, from Selma to Montgomery uh, for part of that and has just been uh, on just raising good trouble for many years. So uh, I look forward to learning more and hearing more stories. And I, I can tell by the chat that you do too. So, all right. So Rhonda, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, great. I'm going to read a couple of the chats and then we can go over to Anna, Anna and our next gentleman. So let me get back into our system here. I am on my phone. Here we go. Oh, it's a long list. Here we go. This is awesome. <laughs> okay. So we started with um, Libby mentioned that she witnessed an in incident with the police and a young black man this week. And she would like to know if there's more she might have done to help in that situation. So Libby, let's talk to you um, right afterwards. Let's get your input um, after our second participant. Um, also, Kimberly Skirm mentioned, Manja, I love this. You are doing, she just loves this. <laughs> she wanted to give you big, Big ups. Um, also, Connie mentioned, um, my understanding from some of my white colleagues is that their understanding of Black Lives Matter is the same as the signs of whites only. They are not the same. It is not the same sentiment. Spring George mentions the doctrine of discovery includes all doctrines, policies, and practices based on advocating superiority of peoples or individuals on the basis of national origin or racial, religious, ethnic, or cultural differences. This doctrine is the foundation of laws in Europe and the United States going back to the 1700s. Gina mentions i had a white friend tell me gina most of us don't know any black people we don't think about you you're just not part of our consciousness miss kimberly skirm mentioned that her mom went to little central high during the integration so she was raised to be colorblind 
While I have much to say about this topic, it pains me to the core and I would cry if I tried to speak. I'm so sad that white people think this way is just as racist, I'm sorry, think this way. I have said for years, it is just as racist now as it was during the heyday of the civil rights movement. The only difference is that people have become more sophisticated at hiding their racism. And YC says, yes, so true. Gloria Yates says, truth to the power. <laughs> And we had a uh, Gina mentioned that her dad used to tell us that his mom said, if I send you into a store to buy a camel, you better bring it out in a bag with a receipt. Black life. Manja, there's a few more. Um, do you want me to stop there and then I can continue on in the second half of it? Yeah, that'll be great. So let's just reset the room and prepare for questions. For those of you who have been waiting to ask questions, if you can reference um, I, I know it was triggered by something that we said before. So just reference that before you um, ask your question. Thank you. Yeah. So Anna. Uh, hi, I'm Anna. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for hosting this talk. I just found this on Eventbrite and I'm really hoping to continue to uh, attend these talks in the future. Thank you. Um, yeah. I might've kind of, I'm a little bit late to the party on this one, but uh, I earlier, uh, Manda, you asked about kind of uh, the experience uh, of people who do uh, live with white privilege. And um, I have noticed um, among my fellow white people, a trend of, uh, and I mean, uh, Robin D'Angelo struck upon it very succinctly in the quote you had on the screen of there's this like bone deep refusal to admit to, uh, uh, let alone confront uh, the racism that is in inherent in people simply because prejudice, as you said, is taught. Um, you know, the in, in schools, the uh, history that is taught isn't so much actual reflections of uh, the legacy of the United States of America as a settler colonial nation built upon slavery but uh, and stolen land, uh, but it's more neatly packaged propaganda. Um, and so I have noticed that there's this understanding among people I grew up around where if you're not wearing a white hood, then, oh, no, 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 I'm not racist. I'm not like those people. Mm -hmm. um, and they can't recognize that by nature of being raised in a society that is prejudiced, they don't understand microaggressions or the ways in which racism isn't just black, uh, well, con contrasted, you know, either you're racist or you're not. There's a spectrum, I suppose, mm -hmm. of levels that all event like inevitably propagate the same uh, perpetuation of prejudice um, and continuing a system uh, that marginalizes and oppresses people. Um, and also the doctrine of discovery was mentioned and in one of the images you showed, uh, there was a one of the, the rioters was attempting, I guess, a sort of Native American costume which was wild and one of the in uh i follow a couple indigenous activist accounts on, on instagram and one of them was commenting on how all of the marginalization and oppressions that take place in uh, western society in general and american society specifically um is rooted in settler colonialism um and uh, yeah, I had another point, but I can't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, uh, oh, I think also the, um, I'm reminded of a book called How the Irish Became White, yes. which talks about the fact that, um, you know, whiteness is not a culture so much as a system of hegemony. Um, and 
different um, cultural backgrounds, you know, um, I mean, initially in the United States, the history of the United States, whiteness was only um, linked to people who were specifically Anglo-Saxon. So like Irish and Italian and Eastern European peoples were, were discriminated against. Um, but they were able over time with the help of scientific racism in the 19th century to assimilate and uh, become part of whiteness um, as a system. Um, and so not only does uh, whiteness uh, keep people from connecting to specific um, cultural identities and remembering that, you know, it's not all one thing, um, but it l legitimately um, helps them uh, continue this system because it benefits them. Um, so yeah, I that was really it. But thank you so much for holding this talk. Thank you. There, there are more to come. I uh, appreciate your comments and your observations. So I'm going to call on Robert Webb Bay. And uh, we share more than just the last name that is my brother. So come on, uh, <laughs> Sunjiata, bring it. I'm ready for you. So I, don't, I said to Mana, I was like, I don't want to get you in trouble. So I'm her brother. But I don't want, you know, when people have to get disclaimers and say, don't hold anything against this particular person. Anything I say, <laughs> do not hold it against Manda. But here's the fortunate thing. Some of the stuff I was going to say, Anna got in trouble for me because she said it. And so I don't I don't have to say some of the things she was going to going to say. But I, I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments and some of the things that were I was reading the chat and say a couple of those things. And then um, I will be quiet. Um, well, that's but, not what this is for. That's not this type of forum to be quiet. So, well, then I'm gonna talk a lot then. No, I, then, but but I'll be, I, you know, I won't take up too much time. I know I just may want to say something as well. But that how Irish became white, um, just that book and that concept is becoming so much more important. It's because white people don't know they're not white. And I, and, and, and I can't, and what I mean by that is the concept of white as a concept as a concept was brought about in order to oppress other groups of people. They were not white before they came here. They were European. And the way that they utilize it even gives them the idea that they are the ones who own America. They're not, they're not from here. They came here from, from somewhere else and utilized this terminology of white and then called other people other things in order to continue to oppress them. And whiteness is a moving spectrum, right? Like we're starting to see currently that they're starting to add even different Latino populations into the concept of white, right? And they're doing that very strategically because they, because white never wants to be the minority. I even remember hearing them say, um, when the minority becomes the majority, and I thought to myself, well, how, how can the, if the minority is the majority, how are they minority? Which lets you know that the idea of minority that they were coming with is meaning non-white people will always be the minority when we know that is not true within the world. Um, and so I, I appreciate Anna for bringing, for bringing uh, that up. Ex exactly. The leader, and that's, and that's what's important. Right, the leader of the Proud Boys, the leader of the Proud Boys not being white is important because the, the, the point I was trying to make is that we have to understand that whiteness and white supremacy is a system, which means that anyone can implement it and advocate it, and many do. And so when people are confused when black officers commit heinous crimes against black people, there's no need to be confused when you understand that whiteness, the way it perpetuates itself, the way it shows itself, can be shown in many people. And oftentimes it is shown quite a bit in those who are not a part of the white group, right? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of books by Paulo Freire who talks about this, as well as Frantz Fanon who talks about about this sort of phenomenon, whiteness is being implemented, um, and, and it could be implemented by any race, right? Um, and so sometimes people get confused by that. And the one thing I want to say in terms of the capital, there was not a single person of color who was surprised and or shocked at what happened at the capital. Not a one. The reason we weren't surprised or shocked is that there is a historical precedent for what happens when white people, specifically white men, feel as if they are getting the short end of the stick. What does the short end of the stick to white men look like? Equality or anything that looks similar to it. 
they began right. Wilmington, North Carolina, was the they literally had a coup in North Carolina to get predominantly black people out of political office. Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? The KKK, the white shirts, the red shirts, all these things were brought about whenever there was some advancement in terms of equality, white people, specifically white men, struck back to make sure that um, that, that, that that was not happening, right? And so sometimes we get caught in talking up and talking about racism. We get caught up in talking about individual experiences. Those are important. But that's not the the most sinister way that racism or the uh, or that racism works. The most sinister thing about racism is that it's systemic. It is systemic, and those systemic things individual issues. But the reason why I'm saying we can't get caught up in individual things is that that leads someone to say, "Well, I didn't do anything, so therefore I'm not racist." Or that person never experienced it, so therefore there's no racism. And that's not the case. Racism is the fact that the Homestead Act that was passed in 1862 by Abraham Lincoln in 1862, which gave the majority of what he called average citizens free land, free land, and that that land that they received, the people who received that land, and listen, they received the land, it wasn't land that was just empty. They received it from the natives who were on that land. They received it from the the people who we now call Mexicans who were on that land, and they were given it to it. They were given that land free, and it rolled over to the point where forty million people today still benefit from the land ownership that they were given. It was never called welfare. It was an actual legislation that they gave specifically to white men and white people, the people they call average American citizens, the people who were Mexican never benefited from the land. The natives never benefited from the land. My ancestors, people of African descent, never benefited from that land whatsoever. That one particular act led to the point where we have, uh, where it helped to create what is currently the white middle class of today. That was in 1862 or 1863, and it was passed by Abraham Lincoln, right? And so that is an example of systemic racism. An educational example of systemic racism is the fact that we all know, and I was just talking about this earlier, and then I'll, I'll be quiet. We all know the Pythagorean theorem. We all know that. And the Pythagorean theorem is the theorem that is uh, that makes what shape, right? It, that makes the shape of the triangle. And it's named after Pythagoras, who's Greek. But most of us don't learn that Pythagoras himself learned in Egypt. And how is that easy? Because guess where the Pythagorean theorem was actually being implemented? In Egypt and the pyramids. <laughs> it's not difficult. Yet the theory is attributed to someone Greek. All of our planets are contributed to Roman gods. The Romans never, ever ever found planets. Our moons are contributed to Greek names. Um, the lunar system is named as the Greek goddess Luna. The Greeks were not savvy in terms of finding moon systems. They thought that the earth was flat. We learn more about Euro European failures than we do about African accomplishments. This is how systemic racism is. It is in our language. It's in our understanding. It's so deeply embedded that when, that when people, non-white people act out the system of, of whiteness, that sometimes we get really confused. The last thing I want to say is, if someone mentioned something about being colorblind, please don't be colorblind. Please see my, my culture, see my history, see my ancestry. Colorblind and I, I know that the uh, person who said something about it, that it came from a kind space. And so I don't want you to feel lamented in any way. But colorblindness is just another fancy neo-colonial <laughs> form of racism, which means because oftentimes when we talk about colorblindness, we say, well, everyone is just human. Yeah, but human from what perspective? Right. Because the human, the perspective that colorblindness often comes from is they say, well, everyone's normal and normal means whiteness in the society. And it's so ingrained in everything that we do. And we see that we don't even know that it's there. And so I don't want anyone to be colorblind. See the fact that I have you because that's who I am. That is my background. Um, and so it is it is not of a benefit to not see the fact that we're different nationalities and we're different different you know groups of people it is beneficial to know and see those things and so i'm gonna stop there i hope i didn't get mine in too much trouble i try to do my best <laughs> thank you i'll put the, okay do me a favor and put those um the names of those books that you mentioned if you could put them in a the chat and give you a little homework that would be fantastic thank you so um Anna, i see your hand is up sid you had something you wanted to share sid collins um chesapeake film festival 
Yes. Okay. Um, Introduce I'm, yourself. Oh, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fascinated. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you all, certainly Manda and Rhonda and all of you who are here tonight, because I'm, I also feel very humbled to participate. Um, my biggest comment tonight, and I, because I don't know how many sessions of these I'm going to be able to attend, and I would like to attend more, is we have been in the last four years through some of the most traumatic time in our history, as far as I'm concerned. I was, I am old enough to have experienced some aspects of what was going on with the civil rights movement certainly trying times as well, the loss of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, horrible events. The last four years have been horrendous. And what I ask us all to do is work very, very hard to figure out what our common ground is. What is our common ground? And I feel like this new administration is bringing new light and new hope, hopefully for all of us. So I hope as we move forward, we will get to know each other and find, find the very, very deep level of respect that we need to have for each other in order to make a better future, not only for ourselves, for our children, for the people we teach, for the people we love, and um, for a better world. Thank you, Sid. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, um, you know, speaking from your experience and from speaking from the heart. Uh, I just uh, appreciate you. So, and thank you for being here. Because um, I know your schedule is busy. Uh, everyone, Sid is, uh, Collins is the director uh, of programming for the Chesapeake Film Festival. She resides on the board and uh, she just, uh, her, her film uh, was Arc of Light. Mm -hmm. A portrait of Anna Campbell Bliss, yes, a indeed. Anna Campbell Bliss uh, just got international distribution, so I want to celebrate her successes. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, Anna, you Thank have your hand on here. Oh, you're welcome. No, I just put the clap emoji. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was the hand raised. Okay, so Rhonda, I'm passing it back to you before we reset the room and talk about solutions. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add with what's going on today um, or the comments that we have? Take it away, Aranda. Yes. Spring George. Spring George. Oh, I'm here, dear, but I didn't really, um, I think I, I'm good with just listening in to everything. <laughs> I had a question for, I think I had asked, um, I was responding to a comment that, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly, Rebel said, mm -hmm. and I was just, I was asking for clarification because they put in there that um, something about um, privilege, that we're talking about white privilege today, but there are other types of privilege and, and mentioned, said such as socioeconomic. And so I think what you're maybe seeing, Rhonda, is my comment back was, it seems to me that even socioeconomic privilege gets knocked down when it comes to race and color, because we, we see it time and time again, and very, you know, uh, very affluent people, if people don't know who they are, get treated differently. And so there's a very, very small group uh, if you were going to say black and brown people, very small group where they're so widely recognized where their socioeconomic privilege, you know, allows them to live. But there are other people that if they're not recognized, well, their lives have been put in danger. I mean, even Dr. Lewis Gates, you know, remember that that incident and even more recently, the medical doctor who was gathering supplies to take to the, those in need. and literally was put in handcuffs of his own home in front of his children in a very affluent neighborhood. So uh, that's that's the only, that's basically my comment and my question as I was asking about, I think um, I was asking about the socioeconomic privilege and just was just trying to understand what Rebel was, was commenting on. So that's it. Thank you. 
We have Carol Lassiter. Uh, she asked a question. Do you think that understanding the who, what, why, when, where of the slave trade, I mean, actual truth about the slave trade would help to heal the racial divide? Uh, anyone want to chime in on that? It also helps that if you press the um, raise hand button, that can keep me focused on continuing our discussion. Oh, I see, Carolyn. I see two hands, Manda. Two hands are up. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, you see um, it? Okay. Okay, so we've got um, Georgia, uh, Mrs. Gosley, we've got Libby Gill, and um, we have Kathy Sade, who is ex um, uh, Kathy, Kathy, your president, right, of Women in Film and Video, which we're all involved, so I'm looking forward to hearing your comments. And um, so, yeah, uh, let's start with Mrs. Gosley. Allison, is your hand up? Okay. Ms. Ghazi, unmute yourself. Okay. If it's your phone, just in, look at it. Okay. In terms of uh, whether learning more about the slave trade, whether it would help uh, white America to better understand and be more empathetic with the plight of African Americans, as much as I'm an optimistic person, no, I don't think it will. There seems to be something that I can't put my finger on and I don't think I've heard many people, maybe never heard anyone who's really identified. I know we talk about white privilege, but what is it that makes some of them, many of them just mean and evil and wanting to put, what is it, that element, is this a, spiritual, truthfully, I think we need divine intervention in, in America because I've lived a long, long time and I've seen over the decades uh, a continuity of just pure hate, mm -hmm. hate for the very color of my skin. What the hell is that? How do you drill down on somebody and say, excuse me, because your skin is light and mine is brown, where does all that come from? Nobody on the planet Earth developed that other than just getting together and deciding we're going to do this. It's much like the Senate right now who's just going to be obstructionist just because we can. So I, I, I just don't, I, 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 you can see I can't really understand uh, why it exists and why it's perpetuated. But, and then to leave that topic and talk about what we have in common even though we have this hatred in America against black people, I'm jumping up and down right now. We have an African-American, Asian, black woman who's vice president. We have a great president who's coming in who really sincerely wants to change things. So what is the solution? I don't know much more than to say that America in its essence is aspirational. Aspirational in the sense that can you bring people from all the over the world, put them in uh, the United States of America, this 300 million um, people melting pot, and let us get along. Because other countries, you got Germans who are Germans, the Swiss are Swiss, the British who are British. But here, you have people, it is the melting pot. And I, I just got to tell you, I feel so optimistic now. I feel optimistic for a couple of reasons. African American women, in our society have totally always been on the bottom of the rung. So you got white men, white women, black men and black women. We as a group have said to hell with you, we're going to take our place now. Nobody can outwork us, nobody can outthink us, but for African-American women, I love, Joe, I love Joe Biden. I think he's a sincere white man who really, really wants to do the right thing. And I think we're right there to keep our fingers saying, yes, dear president, we appreciate you. Now let's get that done. <laughs> That's how I feel. Thank you, Ms. Gazi. I'm so sorry. I was, I was born a kiss to my nephew. So trust me, that, that it looked weird. Well, I was, you was so... a kiss, man. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. 
Listen, I've got to say good night. I've got another engagement. Always my pleasure. Call me again, please. Thank good you. Good night, everybody. Thanks for your comments. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Wally. Hi. Bye. How are you? Good. Good. Good to see you. Okay. He's free and he's done. Oh, <laughs> so, um, Anna and Libby, I know you want to tell your story because I want to use your story to segue into once we reset the room, what can we do to move forward? How can we heal? That type of thing. So we've got um, Anna and then Kathy. And I, okay, I think those are all the hands so far. Okay, so Anna. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, um, it's Anna, but it's it's fine. Um, thank you, thank you, Anna. No, it's okay. Um, yeah. So uh, listening to Miss Gosley talk about where this like profound hatred comes from, um, I don't know that. I mean, obviously, I can't answer that, but I think. Um, my background is mainly in uh, comparative literature, which obviously uh, involves history and cultural studies of many kinds. But uh, I study the Gothic genre a lot, and um, it's the the Western Gothic. Not that there aren't other kinds of Gothics um, that have been reclaimed and revised um, by uh, other, uh, like the feminist Gothic, the queer Gothic. Uh, the uh, Black Gothic, like um, there's a documentary called Horror Noir, which focuses on that, which is really amazing. Um, but I digress. Uh, the figure of the other is really central to Western civilization, um, which the Western civilization that created whiteness as a system. Um, and the figure of the other is um, obviously um, encompasses anyone who is not the, you know, straight white male figure, but encompasses some people more than others. Um, anyone who is, uh, the more different someone is, the easier it is to portray them as the other and project all of the fears and anxieties inherent in um, a system that is constructed upon superiority, uh, the easier it is to project those anxieties upon the figure of the other. So I saw someone comment on the uh, dehumanization that occurred during slavery. Um, I think it also started during uh, the beginnings of colonization. Um, in the medieval era, obviously there was forms of uh, uh, lack of understanding and differentiating between different groups of peoples, but racism proper as we experience it today developed later on, uh, as I understand it. And uh, yeah, I just think the, the ability of our society to create an others and believe in them as if they are real um, and make the other seem monstrous um, is just hugely reflected in the kinds of violence that exist in our society and um, how if you can dehumanize someone and make them the enemy and make them less than human or less human than you are, uh, you can, um, you can uh, justify any level of violence and hatred against them. Yeah, they, they say the best trick the devil ever ever pulled was convincing people he didn't exist, right? So um, I got that from a movie. No, <laughs> but I do understand what you're saying, Anna. And um, I wanted to, uh, you know, again, thank you for your comments and for sharing. I'm Kathy Sade. Come on up to the Take myself off mute. Um, <laughs> great discussion. I'm so glad to be here and learn um, from all of you. And I just have to share this. I think it'll be an interesting data point. Um, so I'm a 50, 52 year old white woman and I, my education about US history occurred in the seventies and eighties. And then I went off to college, didn't really take any history classes, went off to law school and worked, 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 worked in the business world with mostly white people. Had my kids, was busy, busy, busy. 
And it wasn't until my mid 40s, I said, ah, things are kind of settling down. Let me start doing some of those other things I've always meant to do. Um, so I started reading the great books, right? And I would go to Barnes and Noble back when we could go to an actual bookstore and I'd look at the books and I'd say, which book should I read that I, sh I should have read and I never read, so which, so I went through a bunch of stuff. One day I went in, I said, Uncle Tom's Cabin, I've heard something about this book, I'm gonna read it. Not really knowing too much about anything. And you know how they say a book, a great book takes you there. And I didn't get all the way through the book. Um, but I read enough to be horrified, just absolutely horrified. Um, and obviously I've since learned about, there's a lot around Uncle Tom's Cabin, but I'm just talking about the experience of a reader imagining what it would be like to be a character and that woman crossing that river to protect her child. And it just, it just struck something in me. So that was many years ago. So I started learning more like, okay, I'm American. What, what, what is all this thing about slavery. Like, I guess I learned it in high school, but um, Jim Crow, lynching, all these things that I'm now aware of, I would say up until about four or five years ago, I was like, I kind of knew like Jim Crow doesn't have something to do with voting. I mean, it is shocking to me now and I'm still learning. I'm horribly uneducated, um, but I am reading a US history textbook now because I want to really understand everything. Um, I just got through reconstruction, so I'm getting getting my way through. But um, I would just offer that as, as a data point. I guess I'm relatively educated. I have a law degree. But for me, um, this is such a part of our country and not, you know, it's embarrassing not to have known this stuff prior to such a late stage in my life. And so many things make more sense now, so many more current events. Um, I look at incarceration in a whole new light, knowing the history of our country. So I, to the person in the chat who said, would an education help? I firmly believe um, that, you know, I'm hoping they teach it better in schools now than, than they did when I was going through it. So, and still have so much to learn. So that's yeah. what I want to share with the group. Thank you. It's, it's the soft underbelly, you know, of this country. I, um, many of you know my first film, uh, Zoo Volker Show, was about the last known human zoo that took place in Brussels, Belgium. And a college professor asked to show it in his classroom. And I asked him, and want, you know, wanted to know what the feedback was. And he said, um, most of our students were shocked because they didn't know that about our history. And it's, you know, one of the things that we do, we, we cover it up or we don't share it at all because it's the ugly, it's the soft underbelly, those things that make us vulnerable. And so um, I wanted to uh, kind of reset the room and bring Libby Gill back up. And Libby is um, absolutely amazing. She has several books. Um, I'm going to put the her um, the link to her website in the chat. Um, her latest uh, the and she's a leader. So one of the reasons a leader in marketing, sales, um, PR. Uh, she's written the Hope Driven Leader. You are unstuck. And her most recent book, Leadership Reckoning. And I wanted, uh, Libby, if you can tell us about your experience and then kind of transition to what types of things we can do to, to come together. I mean, it's, it's, it's gonna take a lot of work, but we can't just sit and say, oh, it's gonna take a lot of work and oh, it's gonna take a lot of work. I mean, because, you know, a pebble thrown into a lake, the ripples can reach to, you know, other parts of the world. So we have to be that butterfly effect. We have to be the pebble and, and not let it daunt us. And there's a lot of work to be done. With regard to the reading, Sanjata, um, Kathy, you may want to put some um, books in the chat that Kathy can read to help her further her education on um, African and African American history. Okay. Okay. So Libby, okay. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Mondo. This is such a profound discussion and, and a few things are striking me. One was Gina's comment that people don't know any black people. And I, I think it's part education and it's part having black people close to you. And, and I have had that for many years and I can't not see what's my black friends. I may not experience it, but boy, I witness it. Um, but, and this is very timely because just a couple of days ago and I'm a privileged white woman. I live in a nice neighborhood in Los Angeles. I was out walking, walking home. I see a cop pull out in little Westwood village part of LA here and sirens going 
And I'm thinking all I saw ahead of him was a bicycle. What's that about? So I'm walking and I pass cop car, young black man on a bicycle with his grub hug bag. And I'm, I started to walk by on my way home and I thought something looks off here. I'm gonna just kind of back up and listen to this conversation. And it was, many of you have experienced it. Family members I'm sure have. This guy was just grinding this kid about where was he going? He ran, apparently ran through a red light on an empty street. And he's saying, I understand, give me the ticket. I understand, give me the ticket. And I watch this officer and by then I'm like creeping closer and closer and turning my phone on. This officer sort of winding him up with asking him questions, you know, what's his address? Where's very calm, very, and then here's another cop car. He's called for backup. And they go through this whole thing about who are you and what's your name and what's your this and what's your that and just going on and on, same questions. And I'm thinking, this poor kid, and he's saying, I'm going to deliver my Grubhub. I'm sorry I ran the red light, didn't realize it, give me a ticket. So this just is continuing. I'm, it's on to about 30 minutes now. There's another white woman who walks up. She's also on the phone. Then here comes the third cop car. By then they've said, we got to search you. And he said, no, you got no reason. He's got his backpack and his, his bag of food. No reason to search me. You got no cause. Then it's sit down, stand up, sit down. They throw the cuffs on it. And then um, another third car comes along. And this happens to be a black female officer, which I couldn't help think was by design. Let's bring in the black woman cop to now start the same questioning over and over and over again. Then finally, she says, well, there's somebody with a similar name and a birth date close to yours. And so he says, well, so what? What, what does that mean? And they said, well, there's a no bail warrant out for that person. And if that's you, we got to take you in. If it's not you, we'll let you go. And he says, okay, how long is that going to take? And by now he's revved up, he's cursing, he's yelling, but he's also had, he's been calm enough to call his Grubhub customer and say, the cops stopped me a block from your house. I'll be there soon. And, uh, you know, and we're just taping away, just thinking if this were the dark of night and nobody were around, this kid would be in some serious trouble because he's by now mouthing off. And it's so understandable to see how, how anxious and revved up he is so by design. So finally they decide, okay, that's not you. And he said, I told you, I don't have a warrant. I'm just, you know, and so they let him go. They give him the ticket, which I thought was just really wow. fucked up. Give the kid the ticket and they let him go. And then I happened to continue on my, I just wasn't gonna leave until it was resolved. And I rounded the corner heading home and here's the kid delivering his food to a graduate housing unit. And I said, listen, I'm so sorry. I didn't know what I could do. And he said, I'm just grateful you were there. And I said, I wasn't leaving till it got resolved. Um, and I could at least figure out if I could do anything, at least be a witness. Or, and my son said, you need to turn that footage into the ACLU. I don't know what else I could have done, if anything, but I felt like having a couple people there as witness and getting the names of the cops and seeing what happened uh, was all I knew to do. So I'm open to what else does a, a, a white lady do in that situation? Because it obviously happens all the time and far worse. So I'm just throwing it out to you to say, was there anything more I might've done to help that situation? Because I, I honestly don't know. I felt like that's that's all I had the presence of mind to do. But um, I think your son was right. I think your son's suggestion was a good one. Very good. Because when Jeff Robinson gets a hold of it, it's all good. Is that an abuse of of this this young man's confidentiality of who he is? I mean, I didn't ask for permission. He knew we were filming, and he seemed to like give us the please do. And then later he was grateful. But is that right for someone who, who may or may not want his footage shared with the ACLU? I don't know the answer to that. That was my first concern. I would, think I would err on the side, Libby, of giving it to the ACLU with the caveat that 
this is not by his request. This is something I witnessed and I wanted you to be aware of it. Got so it. I would do it from that direction. Um, you know, I, you know, you and I tend to think PR and do we have, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, like the rights to it, like you're saying, is this an okay thing to do? But this is something you physically witnessed yep. and you captured it with your phone and you're showing the footage of what you witnessed. And, you know, if it shows the police officers who were involved, they need to be, you know, there's action, um, like, um, I don't know who that was, maybe it was Krishan, who, who, there's action that can be taken about their abuse of, of kind of that stop and frisk mentality that they do where it's, you know, specifically to... Here's where it know. just kills me, and, and then Malcolm Gladwell has a very good essay on police training about this exact subject, um, but they technically by their training probably did nothing wrong. But if it had been me um, or one of my kids, would they have been stopped? I doubt it. So that that's the, that's the- I don't, I don't know if that's true that they did nothing wrong because you know when somebody runs a red light or whatever it is, I mean, there are certain things, and I'm sure, I'm sure they always say, oh, I feared for my life. Or I mean, there are all the reasons why I can take extreme action and it's, yeah. it's justified. But what we learned, of course, after watching January 6th is that they actually can refrain from taking, you know, death action. So in that situation, it's really when, when they're not, I mean, it, it was a ticket. It was a red light. It was a ticket and it was a bicycle. A bicycle. It was like he couldn't escape. Right. He not hurt anybody. Yeah. Calling in three cars and all of that. That's intimidation. Yeah, I think I so. mean, at, at the very least, that's intimidation. And that's what law enforcement is not supposed to be. Like they they wonder why we don't have a good relationship with them. Part of it is that piece of you're intimidating. You go over and above when because he kept saying, give me the ticket, give me the ticket. And recognizing I went through the red light and that kind of thing, that it was overkill. Yeah. It was overkill. I watched them wind up this poor kid who started calm, ready to take his ticket and be on his way to screaming like you racist motherfucker at these cops. And I thought it felt like if we hadn't been there, they would have just he would have been in some serious trouble. Yeah, Libby, I, I think you may have helped to, I mean, de-escalate to the extent that you were there, being a white woman witnessed it on the, on the phone uh, was helpful. But um, you, you talked about the ACLU, but Ava DuVernay started um, uh, like a watch group for police that um, do disparaging things called LEAP. Law Enforcement Accountability Project, and they're tweeting all the time when things go down because you know um, if someone says, "Well, I didn't see it," or "Well, no," now all, anyone who has a phone is a journalist, and anyone who has a phone can record and uh, can can upload um, to this site. So I'll look for the actual website before we end and put it in the chat because we we're, we're right around eight thirty. But if anyone wanted to stay on for, you know, another 15 minutes or so to kind of, you know, finish up and wrap things up and just talk about, you know, a hope for the future, um, I, would, I would appreciate that. And I thank you. But I thank you for being here if you have to jump. And uh, this will be uploaded to YouTube so you can share with uh, your friends and colleagues. Rhonda, where are we? We are at 8.31 p.m. I went ahead and posted thank our you. IG. And also, our next show will be February 24th, 2021, the Black Doll Test. If you want to share a little bit about that for a moment. Yeah, I want to, um, I will thank you, Brian. Uh, is there, does anyone have any other like, observations or, um, or, or thoughts about what we can do moving forward? to kind of mitigate this type of foolishness, to kind of mitigate the, the misunderstandings and the quote unquote fear. Again, I, you know, the, the, to think that there is fear of, of a black planet is absolutely ludicrous to me. But if there's something, and Robel, thank you. You were very active on the chat. So if you wanted to, to speak up, we'd love to hear you. Um, but if, if anyone just wants to kind of jump in and share, we are open. Oh, thank you, Ms. Monda. How, thank you, everyone, for having this uh, discourse. Uh, 
Um, I'm actually Macy's nephew, Macy Dunbar. Um, oh, nephew. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's real good to hear you. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, but no, it's great. We have to keep having these discussions. Um, I'm also part of this racial justice committee here in Kensington, and they have been doing a lot of um, reaching out to the community and 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 to various uh, people at Hopkins, uh, legislators, senators. So I think just moving forward, we need to have more discourse and more legislation. Like, um, I think we were just talking last night with a few people, uh, Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. I mean, I guess, but we really need um, legislation and, and, and things, you know, in place that are protecting, you know, people of color. And I'm glad that he did do the Keystone Pipeline because there's a lot of stuff going on with them drilling and all that through Native American lands and, and reservations. So that's that's a start. You know, we need policy. That's all I want to say. More policy, more discourse, and um, just bringing the truths to the forefront. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Margaret. Yeah. One of the things that all of us can do uh, and encourage your friends to do is to contact your senators, contact your members of the House of Representatives on the federal level as well as the state level. And some of the issues that black people face, there are three things right now we can encourage the senators and uh, House of Representatives to pass. That's the George Floyd uh, Policing Act. That's the John Lewis Civil Rights Act to update what was taken away from us in 2013 after the uh, Eric Holder of Selma Montgomery file was just, they just obliterated that Civil Rights Act of 1965. That's on the board, that's on the issue again. The other thing is we've never ever had a federal anti-lynching law. We need that, that's up, the Emmett Till law is up. If we can just do those three things in the next several months, that's one step ahead of helping not just black people, but all people have equality in the United States of America. The right to vote should be something that is on everybody's table. And we can do this by just bombarding the federal, the senators, especially the Republican senators, especially, to pass those votes and do it soon. Thank you. I'm putting the solutions in the chat. Why don't we have an anti-lynching law? Why hasn't that been passed? It's been on the books for over a hundred years. It has. Cory Booker tried to get that approved um, last I know. year. It, each year, it, it, John Lewis before that, and before that, and before that, and I just I know that it has passed the House a couple of years ago. Well, last year I suppose, but it's hung up in the Senate. This is an opportunity to pass that. When you said that, Miss Margaret, I literally got cold chills knowing that that was not a law on the books. I literally got goosebumps. That is terrifying. No. Well, it is in some states. And the well, feedback that I heard that- right. States, yes, but not a federal. But yes. not a federal. And the, com the commentary around some senators who shall go nameless said that it's no need to pass this because the states are taking care of it. Mm. which is BS. And they showed up with the gallows on January 6th. I think there's a reason to have a federal law. You betcha. Hey, Imanda, I just want to thank you for having um, this today. I learned a lot um, from different guests, different opinions. And, you know, the thing that I get frustrated with is that, you know, I'm, I can contact my legislators and other people, but I have to always step back and look in the mirror and say, you know, what can I do? Right. And, you know, I'm just a little five, two black woman out there in America trying to make a buck. And um, I think, you know, the biggest thing that I, I've done in 2020 is just bring up conversation when I can with my colleagues who are, who are mostly white, ask their thoughts, ask their opinions, make my comments. So there's more uh, open conversation, more transparency. 
Um, I'm more involved with um, equity, diversion, and inclusion while it's hot. I got to get there. Um, so, you know, I look at, you know, what can other people do for us? And now I got, I got to look at what can we do for ourselves and keeping the conversations open and not being afraid to pick it up. You know, I watched something miraculous with those um, kids in Black Lives Matter. And I think that's where my biggest inspiration came from. And it just wasn't Black kids out there. It was all kids, white, Latina, Black, et cetera. And that really gave me hope, kind of like how John Lewis expressed. Mm -hmm. So how can I how can I sit back when I see these babies out here mm -hmm. marching on my behalf? So anyway, thank you for doing this. Thank you. Manda, um, just one thing I would caution people is to right now there's um a I believe it's CIA, FBI, or who knows who that are behind a disinformation campaign against Black Lives Matter. There's an entire website, there's an entire nonprofit group that's set up to talk about who's on the board, who's doing what, who's stealing money, who's, you know, and I know my my niece actually is who's who doesn't have a job so she has a lot of time to re read all this stuff and and to but she's really really like sending all this information out to our family about this you know campaign against why black lives matter is so bad and all i do is caution people is to research it for yourself you know so i looked up the organization that has this whole website you know and i, I could all i could see is they were started about two months ago I don't, you don't, you don't have a lot of credibility with me if you were started two months ago, you know, and um, I just tell people to, to look into it for yourself, you know, because there's so much information out there and th this is definitely a, a absolute, all I can think about is all the stuff that I, even as a kid, I remember them saying about the Black Panthers and I, I knew they had done stuff, you know, of course, what, who, what um, Dick or Hoover did with Martin Luther King and just all that stuff. But when that org, because it, 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 it came really from nowhere and grew so big so fast and has so much international support behind it. And there's a lot of legal ways that people can come up with organizations of the same name and they just add Arizona or they, whatever. So there, you know, there may, there's probably been some people out there doing some dirty stuff. And I'm not even saying everybody in the organization is a saint, but I'm saying when you look at, the legislation that this group has been able to get behind and actually push because it's it's just so large and it's got the resources to advertise and do things like that consider your source when you're hearing when you're hearing bad things when you're hearing any kind of information any kind of information you know consider your source and do your own research that's that's all i that's all i'd like to say thanks Brian. Uh, sorry, Margaret. Well, yes, I wanted to, Allison made a statement about her one voice, her one call, or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing I'd like to stress. Every single person is important. That one vote makes all the difference in the world. And if each one of us believe that because we know it's true, and if you exercise that right, you'd be surprised at what we can do. So many people did not vote during primary, at the primary or at midterms because they thought, ha, huh, it didn't matter. And because we did not go out and vote because we didn't think it mattered, look what happened in 2012. Look what might have been had we just advanced the notion that what President Obama was trying to do could succeed if we gave him that chance. But in 2010, we were, it was devastating. The Tea Party took over and they have not let go. Somebody else mentioned about what can we do to undo what has been done? It has taken 400 years, four centuries to get where we are. I don't know what we can do to get where we need to be, except by taking in, instrumental, little incremental steps. Mm -hmm. And part of that in our representative democracy starts with voting. It starts with voting. It starts with voting. Did, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
And if you do that, and if you do it consistently, then you can make changes. You won't make people love you. I, you don't care about that. You care about being equal, about being able to access what other people can do just on the basis because you are another human being. You care about living in an area where your house is equally as valued as three blocks down the street where it's all white. It's in the same area. You care about those things. You care about the education of your children. You care about what your taxes can do. You care about a lot of things and all of that can come to fruition simply by voting and encouraging people you know who don't vote, make sure that they do vote because it's important. Without it, well, without it, we are where we were. Somebody mentioned about the Jim Crow laws. They didn't know about it. I live doing the Jim Crow laws in Memphis, Tennessee. I'll tell you what the Jim Crow laws are. I'll tell you what it did to me and everybody living in the South and in parts of the North. We talk about the South being segregated. Look at Boston. Look at some of these Look at Oregon, the state of Oregon, instituted in 1857, came into the union because they were against slavery, but they were anti-black. They did not want black people living in Oregon. That's why it's, so, it's sort of ludicrous to see that Portland, Oregon now, those white women are out in force. I'm grateful for that. It hasn't always been that way. The United States was based on hatred, based on violence, based on just brute force, exterminating the indigenous, indigenous people in America and proving that white power and brutality could overrule everybody and everything. And they, they, they succeeded because it left a lot of black people feeling they were inferior, knowing within their hearts that they were as equal as anybody else. So for my white brothers and sisters who want to do something to help that not just black people, because when you help everybody, all of us, all of us have an advantage. What you can do is talk with your white brothers and sisters, because I've never yet found any friend of mine who was white, who didn't have a huge number of family members who were anti-Black. We need to start there first. I can't help that. I can't help you help them understand what it means for a Black body to feel that they are less than human. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of strength. So when you see these Black people on the screen or out in the public, you will know they have gone through hell just to be able to sit and stand and have a job. Amen. You, you, you don't understand that because you just walk into something. We cannot just walk into something. It takes a hell of a lot of guts to do it. And it takes a lot of heartbreak and a lot of crushing and a lot of, uh, a lot of remorseful feeling of how can people be so ugly and so mean and so hateful and they don't even know me. They don't know me but they know that my skin is black and therefore they hate me to begin with. So talk with your white friends, talk with your white brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and nieces and nephews. And if you can get just a few of them to understand what it means to be human, we're on the road to recovery because the more you can convince them that we are human beings with a soul and a heart and feelings, the better off we are. So, and it, and as Kathy, Kathy, I so appreciate your learning because I know you didn't, that they didn't teach you in school. They didn't teach me in school either. So as adults, it's up to us to educate ourselves. One thing I would say, using a United States history textbook is not where you're going to get truth. That's not, that's not truth. You need to dig a little deeper than somebody who wrote a textbook or a group of students who watered down everything because it's, it's meaningless. So I, I'm sitting in a room with nothing but books. 
I wish you were here and I could point out what it is that you could read that I think will help you understand the trauma that goes on in a black body every single day they wake up. Not just on the weekend, every single day they wake up. It would make a difference. So. Amen. Kathy? Um, first of all, I wish I wish I could come over there and, and have a cup of tea with you, but there's this pandemic because I would love to talk with you more. <laughs> um, but to your point about the textbook, I totally get that. Um, the reason I went to the textbook is that I wanted like the skeleton of the timeline to hang all the other information on. Um, but I just want to acknowledge that I am getting a textbook written by um, one author's perspective and it's just the beginning, so. Thank you. Uh, Manda, Margaret, perhaps 10 books that could help us be more realized, be really good. I mean, finding time to read with all the other stuff going on, but that way we at least get a perspective from another side could be really useful. Okay, well, why don't I send the list to Manda and uh -huh. one of the things that could, what, the book, even though I'd gone through graduate school, the whole thing, a history major, one of the books that I picked up at one of the bookstores years and years ago was uh, 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 Sims, of, uh, Sims of the Fathers. It's written by an Englishman about England and he took the diaries of slavers and it was the it was an eye opener for me. I thought I knew a lot about slavery. So, but that would that has something to do with black history per se, but these were people being taken from Africa, stolen from Africa and brought to uh, Jamaica or Haiti or the United States. So I'll start with that. It's an eye opener. It, it really, it, it just added so much nuance to what I had been taught in a history book. It just brought it to life. And I'll send, I'll give Manda a list of books that I think might be interesting and helpful and, and ending with one that I just finished reading called The, the, the Weeping Time. It's 1859, uh, slave, the largest slave auction in the United States history. Uh, and uh, that, that I, well, yeah, I'll have that. Well, there are lots that come that I'm thinking about that. And I always go back to W.B. Du Bois because it was an, that man was a genius. He was brilliant. Uh, uh, dark Water, Voices Within the Veil is one. The Souls of Black Folk is another. Mm -hmm. And um, well, there, I'll send my, I'll, I'll pick out 10 books out of 100,000 <laughs> and, and give them to my Thank you. Okay. Manda, your brother will have some also, along with what you have. And I'm sure there are other people on this call that have some opinions, but getting more knowledge and, and sort of sides of a prism can really help you try to help realize how you can be better. I agree. Um, wholeheartedly and, and I think one of the things to note um, is that you know black people we are earth people we are people of the sun we just inherently have joy and as angry as we may get you know we still forgive and we still love we love hard we love deeply and you know I think you know and we're not a monolith so we don't represent you know one black person doesn't represent the entire black race right. um, however I just think it's important to note that uh, one of the things, a, a theme that you will see repeated uh, in the things that I write in the films that I make is, you know, let's all be human. I, I just, I just don't understand what it is that makes people think that people of color aren't human. I, I still can't fathom that. So um, it's not even, oh, I want what you want. I just, I want to be comfortable. I want to feel safe. And I want to be treated like a human, 100%. So, and I, I appreciate all of you all and as allies. 
wanting to learn, wanting to help because everyone can make a difference. And I know many of you on this call and we've had conversations before and, um, you know, Allison, I know you probably didn't want to choose to share, but you've had some extremely poignant um, experiences since uh, the George Floyd incident within your organization. Um, and Krishan, I know you have, but I just appreciate you all for coming and for sharing and being open and being vulnerable. So um, is there anything else anyone wants to share before we wrap up, Rhonda, anyone? We're really so grateful, Rhonda. Kimberly, Kimberly. Yeah. Kimberly. Sorry, sweetheart. Yes, Kimberly. I was just I saying was just thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you. I don't know why you have the feedback, but thank you. Kimberly's a filmmaker and casting director and storyteller and uh, we share boards and and, and Nixon, you know, we talked think like Sid was talking about common ground. Someone's talking about common ground. So um, all we got to do is talk to each other and we will most definitely find that common ground. Um, okay, Ryan, you want to close us out? after you on mute. Oh, yes, Sid. While Ron is trying to find her voice, uh, Sid, if you can unmute and share. Oh, share. I'm unmuted. <laughs> We're so grateful you're here. We're so grateful this conversation is is here. And, and everyone, Healing Chronicles is, is Manja's love. We have new shows every month, new topics. So we encourage everyone to please join us again. If you can save the date for February 24th. And we will keep continuing this conversation. Thank you so much. Manda? Okay, Sid had a few words. And then we can oh no, thank you, darling. I, I, I just uh, was enthralled by the whole experience. I cannot thank you enough and um, great to meet everyone. Thank, thank you for you. everything. It was a really great show tonight, you guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, take Hi. great good care. Night, uh, good night and I'll share, make sure I share the notes and we'll see you next month. <laughs> great job. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.